want to say to our visitors to please come again. You've only heard two of the six choirs and grace. Thank you. 
Spirit who will abide with us, and that our grief will turn to joy. And here in chapter 17, Jesus prays for us. It's a sincere prayer. It is a compassionate prayer. It is a prayer that is filled with love, a prayer that is filled with longing. It is a prayer between the last supper in the upper room and the agony of his sin. Actually, it is a prayer that we can actually divide into three parts. Verses 1 through 5, Jesus first prays for himself. And then verses 6 through 19, Jesus prays for the disciples who followed him for the last three and a half. And then verses 20 through 26, Jesus prays for all believers, all that will believe because of their message. That's when you and I are Jesus has prayed for us. Within these three parts, there can actually be seen seven petitions. First petition, he says, glorify the Son that your Son may glorify you. Petition to glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Petition three, praise for the believers, the ones that the Father has given him, that they will experience safety in the world and be kept from the evil one. Then he prays for the believers, sanctification. He prays then for the believers, unity. Thus why we pause once a year to commemorate communion as Christians around the world. But we at Grace, let me just put a pin there. We celebrate world communion, but I hope that it reminds us. We often say charity begins at home and then spreads the ball. So today we're commemorating world communion, but let's remember we are one here as well. And if we can practice unity here, then we can be able to practice unity with our brothers and sisters that we do not see. Then he prays, I'm going to go for it, that's all right. He prays that the world may believe. Then finally he prays that those of us who believe in him will live with him eternally in heaven. Well, one of the most encouraging experiences to have as a Christian is to be prayed for by someone else. Oh, uh, y'all, someone knows what I'm talking about. When someone prays for you in your presence, not, not, not they hang up the phone and say, I won't pray for you, but they pray for you, you hear them praying for you. Something special happens within your heart. That there's a sense, actually, of intimacy, both between you and the other person, and between you and God. It is almost as if both of you are not going to have to go together. It encourages a forward relationship. It, it creates unity and harmony. It develops a bond and a union. But maybe that's why they offer the hymn said, Bless be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred ties is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our heart and prayers, our fears, our To be divided when you're praying for one another. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a little hard to pray for someone that hates someone. But when you pray for someone, something happens when you think about nothing. I want to share a personal experience. I have a very good friend, and I'm disappointed that he won't be here this month to share with us through the homecoming. I have friends coming in town that weekend. I have a good friend in Minnesota, and I, I always think back what bonded the friendship. We were at Lake Calhoun in Minneapolis, and we decided to pray. Now, I've always been a big guy, so I sat on the list. The small guy, he sat on the back side of the list. I didn't want to fall over. <laughs> But I always go back 
Paul says, what can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ? What is it that can tear us apart? What is it that can let us lose? Jesus has prayed for us that our faith does not fail us. So we can be one and witnesses for him. But there's another word that he's keep saying. He prays for our sanctification. Not, not just for our protection to keep us, but that we may be sanctified. Which means that we may be holy and set apart. He wants us to be consecrated for his service. Now when I was born, I would hear it expressed like this. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. Christ reconciling the world to himself. 
the importance of oneness and unity is emphasized over and over again in our passage today. Verse 11 says, protect them in your name so that they may be one even as we are one. Verse 20, I pray not only on behalf of these, but also of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one. Verse 23, that they may be one as we are one. Note the oneness and unity is not apart from God the Father. We can't be one by ourselves, beloved. You and I, we will never achieve unity by ourselves. That's why when we counsel couples, before they get married, we ask them to invite God into the wedding, to invite God into the marriage. Because I'm here to tell you that it's hard for two human beings to get along <laughs> and live in the same house and be in unity always. But if you have a common goal, which is God, you'll find that unity can exist. Well, that's the marriage. Well, that's about two people. But let's just say all of you were piano players. And everybody was sitting here trying to tune your piano. And you looked over to your brother, you looked over to your sister, and you tried to tune according to what they were doing. We would never have unity. But what A.W. Tozer tells us like this, that if all of us are tuned to the same fault, and if there's one person, then all will be in union because they're looking to the same source. You and I have come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. But I'd like to suggest to you if we all look to Christ, don't necessarily look to your brother or to your sister, but if we all focus our attention on Christ, when we focus on Christ, we are actually more unified than we can ever be through our own personal fellowships and individual social activities. That is why worship is important in the life of the church. That is why the scripture tells us not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. I know that you like to come to the fashion show, and I know you like to come to the breakfast meeting, but where we get unity is in worship. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper on today. And we're not just taking the Lord's Supper here at Grace on today. But throughout the world, Christians are pointing to remember the table. We're all looking to Christ, even though we may differ in our thoughts and in our practices and in the way we do things, that they all may be one. When we partake of the body and blood of our Lord, it is like all of us have come together to focus on Christ. And when we focus on Christ, we will find that all of the issues that we have for one another begins to fall away because we are all unified on the same purpose in mind. The reason that love and unity is crucial is because it affects our mission. It affects our witness. In this world that is defined by conflict and broken relationships and dysfunctional families and, and fractured communities that look like they don't even exist anymore, it is the love that we show that will mirror Christ to the world. This is to say, beloved, that we have to love one another. Now, I, I have a personal experience. I, I, I would like to suggest that with the Holy Spirit, I was in the Atlanta airport many years ago, and I saw the Harry Christians walking around with their uniforms on. And, and for some reason, I thought I had something. I said, you know what? We got to get a uniform all Christians to wear. <laughs> I mean, if I know that they are a Harry Christian because of the uniform that they're wearing. And I said, that was just some way that I can identify another Christian because we were wearing then I can tell who my brothers and sisters were. <laughs> well, the Holy Spirit said, Quentin, listen, let me tell you something. <laughs> By this shall all know that you are my disciples because you have loved one, one for another. another. It's not an outside man, but it's something that has a strong call on. Beloved, Jesus has prayed for us that we would be 
one. Jesus is praying to the Father that he would protect us, that he would preserve us. He is praying to the Father that he would sanctify us so we can fulfill the mission and call that he has on our life. But Jesus is also praying to make us one. Make us one in heart, one in mind, one in purpose, and one in objective. Listen, beloved, we cannot preserve ourselves. Only God can do that. We cannot sanctify ourselves. Only God can do that. And certainly we found out over time that we cannot bring ourselves together in unity. But God can bring us together. God can cause us to love one another even when we disagree with one another. God can cause us to love one another because we're not focusing on one another, but we are focusing on Him. Today, as we prepare to take communion, as we reflect over the Lord's body, here in this sanctuary on today, believers around the world, we are expressing our love to God and our love for one another as we partake of his body. But I got good news for y'all. Somebody said, what is it? I didn't need to make sure y'all was out there. I went to sleep on that thought I was at the seminary for me. I, I got good news for you. Somebody needs to know that Jesus not only prayed that prayer, but if you remember the seventh petition, he prayed for our eternity. He says in verse 24, Father, I want those that you have given me to be with me where I am, to see my glory, the glory that you have given me because you love me even before the foundation of the world. Beloved Grace, let me remind you as I often quote, and I say this often, behold, what matter? The love of the Father has to about the time that your mother prayed for you. 